Hello Andy, um, this is, my name is Nigel Pennant and I'm finally getting around to doing something that I promised to do some while ago and that has helped you, you with some material for your book. Um, perhaps it's too late and I hope the fact that I'm sending you a tape recording isn't going to make it too difficult for you. Um, obviously it would be impossible to transcribe it all but perhaps I'll, I can suggest a few things that, that will help you. I'll, in front of you I've got your questions and ideas and perhaps I'll just talk through it and uh, see what happens. Um, what's the first one? Yeah, why did I... well, um, the first time I ever went to Charlton was um, when I was at... oh, I should think it was about 61, maybe 64. Uh, I, my re recollection of my first game is a very, very dim. I just know that a friend of my dad, who we called Uncle Ginger because of his red hair, turned up one Saturday midday at, at my parents' flat in Sydenham and said to my mum, oh, I'm taking the boys to football. That was my brother and myself. And uh, I didn't even think about it. All right, we're going to football. I didn't know what to expect. I, obviously, I'd played as a child and um, kicked around in the sort of playground near the block of flats. But I had no idea what, what it would mean, a professional football game. Anyway, um, I think it was quite a big match because... I'm pretty sure Eddie Fermani was involved, and possibly John Huey. Now, my, as I say, my, my dates and that are very mixed up. But um, my first impression of going to the Valley was, was incredible. I think we entered by the San Bartram gates at the top, and to see the vast ground with the pitch, what, miles away it seemed to me, to a little boy, and it was a steep, the sides were, and the um, colour was just really quite impressive. Um, the other thing that impressed me about the game is I think as a little boy playing football um, one of the things that we um, I was always worried about was heading the ball. If the ball was in the air you'd, you'd jump and close your eyes and hope either to miss it or that it wouldn't hurt too much and seeing these players deliberately heading the ball, quite intentionally heading the ball and not only that heading it from one player to another amazed me. They didn't close their eyes or duck or try and get out of the way in case it hurt. They were they were all out to do it. And I, I, I remember being very impressed with that. Um, I must admit that my first games were, I would get bored very easily and my brother and I would chase around the, the crowd in and out of spectators' legs, much to their annoyance. Um, and uh, we generally had a fine time. It was always very exciting. How much did it cost to get in? I think it was something like, sixpence or ninepence for boys and maybe one and three or one and six for for men it was quite compatible with Saturday, Saturday morning pictures that we went to um, so yeah that was my my first impression um, all right, what else um, yeah the the signs um, it was talking about the prices were for boys and OAPs and I don't know if it said men, but you know it was it was the main entrance. It didn't say girls and OAPs or boys and girls and OAPs or children. It was boys and OAP. I don't think that the, there was much expectation that girls would turn up in those days. I wasn't particularly interested, obviously, but I do remember that it was boys that was written above the sign. Um, sometimes my dad, who wasn't working on a Saturday, would come because his friend Ginger had a car. My did, dad didn't have a car. And I remember around about lunchtime on Saturday, you know, when people were turning up for the football, one of the phrases that would be used is, what time's kick-off? Now, I mean, it, I assumed, I've assumed ever since that kick-off is always three o'clock on a Saturday afternoon with the odd midweek game, but presumably the phrases used by my dad and my uncle were born out of the era before floodlights, when obviously kick-off times would vary according to the light of day. And it, it never occurred to me, I mean, it's a phrase that I've never used, what time's kick-off? Um, perhaps it's still in use now, but certainly not amongst younger. So, well, having said that, with the changes that have come in recently in Sunday games and odd times in the evenings and television, I think the phrase is probably making a comeback. What time to kick off? Um, let me see what's next. I hope this isn't getting too tedious. Um, yeah, my dad and my uncle would stand on the big side, the East Terrace, and. Um, we, my brother and I, would wander about all over the um, the ground. There wasn't a, a particular 
formed segregation. I wasn't that aware of away supporters, although they were obviously there. I remember a, a game against Chelsea where there were lots of Chelsea supporters, but there was no segregation. Um, I think there was a, probably a particular focus of vocal support in the cover then, but I think that started more in earnest after about 1966 when England won the World Cup. I do remember loads of people, particularly children, had rattles, and they would be rattled frantically um, after attacks or goals. And in woodwork at school, I made a rattle. Um, it was a big, hefty, chunky thing that, you know, it, it, it took desperate Dan to make it go around and actually click, but I was very proud of it. And I remember taking it to a, a game, although these days it would be definitely regarded as an offensive weapon. Um, uh, it probably wasn't an offensive weapon. If, we, if anyone was in the way of me when I was rattling it, I think I might have floored them. Um, I do remember some odd games. I remember a very good nil-nil draw with Sunderland when I think a young Jim Montgomery was in goal for Sunderland and played brilliantly um, I think they won promotion that year and that might have been about 64 um, I went to a rugby playing school Brockley County much to my annoyance and um, the boys at the school were Charlton and Millwall supporters in the main with a few Crystal Palace thrown in and I do remember um, during boring moments in lessons I would doodle on a piece of paper the hoped for result of the next game in the fashion of the Sunday papers with the um, teams written out neatly in the brackets for the half time results and uh, the names of the players and the times they scored their goals. You know, Charlton Athletic 3, Hull City 1, 15,000 attendance, and Glover and Kinsey would score the goals. I don't think my predictions were ever accurate, but I remember thinking, you know, spending a lot of time doing that. I started to go more regularly when I, after England won the World Cup, I think there was a resurgence in football attendances generally. I would have been about 14 or 15 around about then. And, um, well, more likely 13. They won it in 66 and I was born in 53. And uh, I remember enjoying the game very much then. I think Billy Bonds might have been playing then. I remember hearing chants of Billy for England and people talking about how fast he was. I'm pretty sure I remember him playing right back for Charlton and being quite put out when I heard that he was sold to West Ham for what was what then seemed to be a bit of a giveaway at £50,000. I mean, goodness knows in what he would be worth in today's prices as a player like Billy Bonds. He, you know, I admire him tremendously. I admire him now as West Ham's manager and whenever I saw him play for West Ham, he was a terrific player. I do remember Keith Peacock he was a left winger in the, uh, the first days that I, I went to see them. Players like Lenny Glover, who was also a left winger. Brian Kinsey at right back. Charlie Wright in goal was a particular favourite. I think he'd taken over from Mick Rose um, shortly after I started um, watching them. And he was a, a great player. Um, I used to stand in the covered end in those days and get involved more with the vocal support. I remember seeing us playing Blackpool when they had a little knot of tangerine supported at the other end of one of their players shot and all the tangerine went up it was an obvious goal so they thought that Charlie leapt across and clawed it out and tipped it over from the corner of the net um, very very good goalkeeper I do remember one of his um, I do remember the, the through your legs Charlie incident against Ipswich Town I think they won promotion that year and um, in about the 7th minute somebody scored um, shot and it went through Charlie's legs and that was it 1-0 and that's how it stayed for the whole game What else? Um, these are in no particular order, so I'll, I'll just go through them in the order they're down. Um, my favourite players over the years, well, lots of them really. I've liked. I, I'm pretty much in favour of all of the players. I, I got a very, very soft spot for Derek Hales. I think he was one of the best players I've ever seen. Um, this is, is phenomenal. His speed over 15 yards. I'm sure other people have commented, and uh, the goals he scored were brilliant. I remember once going to an away match at Plymouth. We lost 2-0. And uh, Hales looped the ball over his shoulder from near the corner flag with his left foot. And it went curling into the far um, post. A beautiful goal, but the referee disallowed it for somebody else being offside. And some Hearts supporters who happened to be there in the crowd were remarking what a fantastic goal it was and how it should have been allowed. Now I remember when we played away at Chelsea and um, we won 3-2. And Derek Hales just... Um, tore Ron Harris to shreds in his play. He played very well against Chelsea. He often had very good games against them. And 
um, I also remember the winning goal he got against Fulham in the FA Cup once. I think we were a third division team at the time. Um, when he he hit it on the turn, it was a, just an absolutely beautiful goal. He was a great player, Derek Hay was a really brilliant player. Yeah. Um, another good player was Keith Peacock, who I don't think he ever became a brilliant player until after the age of 30, and then he was he was just superb. He was the the best educated footballer I could imagine. Uh, you know, oh, that's a bad phrase, but he he was so intelligent in midfield. He he was so perceptive with his play and passes, and so economical with his use of the balls. Um, that he was just fantastic. I often remember him warming up before matches when the players would come out. They they developed the habit of coming out before matches, about half an hour before, to the um, music on the tannoy. He would um, skip along in front of the stand in rhythm with the music. And um, you know he was a very very good player. I don't think he was ever booked or sent off. Keith Peacock. He was an absolute gentleman. Uh, uh, one of his best ever games. We've got the. A 1-1 draw away at Queen's Park Rangers in the League Cup. We eventually lost the replay. And um, Peacock was absolutely outstanding. He was... I think Jerry Francis might have been playing for Queen's Park Rangers on the same day. And um, Peacock was just superb. Other players. Oh. Um, I like them. Obviously the players of the, of the modern team. I, like, I very much like Paul Walsh when he came in. Um, Graham Moore was a great favourite. Alan Campbell, brilliant player, brilliant midfield player. I once saw him score a goal against Northampton, who were relegated, I think, in that match, when he dribbled the ball from the halfway line round the goalkeeper and scored. It was a, a fantastic goal. Very disappointed when he went to Birmingham City, Alan Campbell. From those days, those earlier days, Paul Wentz was another very popular player. Um, the strapping centre half with thighs like oak trees. Um, he, he was just a, an excellent player. We brought him from Orient, I think. Eventually sold him to someone like Portsmouth. Um, a very good centre-half. Um, other players from that era? Matt Tease. Oh, of course, Matt Tease. And Ray Tracy. Oh, what a forward partnership they were. The goals that Tease scored with his head were just classic. They were at, he, was, he was built like a piece of string. Very thin, very gaunt sort of player but he could rise and nod that ball and put it wherever he wanted it. And the times that a long, you know, it was before the long ball became a, a noted feature in football, uh, that we would have a long ball down the middle, knock, knocked down by Tees into the path of Ray Tracy, would run through and score. Tracy, of course, was a great player, a brilliant goal scorer, could get goals from anywhere. Um, I well remember the, the goal that was televised against Derby that he scored from about 30 yards, which was just a fantastic goal. In a brilliant game, about 30,000 people. Derby won promotion that year. And Crystal Palace also won promotion for the first time. We were third. And uh, that was a terrific season. G great crowds at the Valley. Um, we had lots of draws at home that season. And I think that prevented us going up, really. One, I think the good Friday morning that, that year, we played Cardiff. And beat them 4-1. Or we were in a 4-0 lead by half-time. And um, the team were just... Brilliant. Graham Moore, Alan Campbell in the midfield, Lenny Glover on the wings, and there was a bit of Bobby Curtis at right back in those days. Um, Lenny Glover, I think, was playing, and uh, oh, we just had a great little team. Man managed by Eddie Fermani, who I thought was a good manager, who got the team to play real football. Um, my, I then became a fanatical supporter. Um, when I left home, I left home very young, I was about 16, and I would go and watch them all the time. I would watch them at hitchhike to away matches. Um, matches that stand out in my memory. Oh, many of them. Um, away at Arsenal in the Cup in about 68, when we lost 2 0. Fantastic game. 56,000 people. We hit the post. Tease hit the post with a header in the first half. And then they scored two goals. I think George, Ar George Armstrong Strong scored one. And uh, we had Paul Hintz, I think, playing for us then, who's now a journalist in Manchester. Um, a lovely game. We'd beaten Crystal Palace in the round beforehand, away, um, again in front of about 40,000 at Palace, which I got in about half-time, just before we got our second goal, another 30-yard screen from Tracy. On, and, um, and the Arthur Waite, what was the Arthur Waite stand then in those days? Um, was just a, a heap of mud, really. You slid around um, watching the game. That was a brilliant night. 
I, I was at the game when we won 4 1 away at Queen's Park Rangers um, and uh, broke our duck of away games, about 30 away games without a win. That was a good one. <laughs> um, Tottenham, when Hales, uh, when uh, Flanagan scored a hat trick and we won 4 1, and that was a terrific game. Um, it was a lovely win, big crowd, you know, it had the valley at its best, with the, the atmosphere was fantastic, the weather was good. It was just glorious in every respect. Um, the best match I've ever seen was probably against Brighton and Hove Albion. Um, Peter Ward was playing for them then, and had just been selected for England, and it was an evening game. A Tuesday evening. And it was the era of Powell and uh, Flanagan and Hales. And we won 4-3. In a game, I think we went two up. Um, they he got to two all. I think they had a penalty, or we had a penalty, and it was missed. Then I think it was th it was three to to us. Then three all to Brighton. Then with about eight minutes to go, Colin Powell cut in from the right, and with his left foot, let off a, a terrific shot from about 20 yards, screaming into the top corner. It was just a fantastic game. Andy Nelson's side was a good side. I mean, they 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 love to attack. I remember he said, "Oh, don't worry about winning the ball. They'll give it to you eventually." It's what you do with it when you've got it that matters. And we had a team that liked going forward. It was it was a beautiful team, brilliant team. Um, other matches that stand out in my memory well away at Spurs when we got a one-one draw in the cup and eventually lost the replay. Um, and Flanagan hit the post, I think, or just skimmed past the post in the last minute. That was a a terrific atmosphere for Charlton supporters. Away at Wolves when we lost 3-0 to a John Richards hat-trick. Fantastic turnout of Charlton supporters. Um, away at Ipswich in the Cup. Another fantastic uh, turnout of Charlton supporters where they, they supported the team brilliantly. Um, other odd matches that stand out in my mind. Um, a lot of them away matches. The 3-0 win at Wrexham. One Boxing Day or December. Somewhere like that anyway. Around about Christmas. Um, when Powell, I think, scored two and Peacock got one. It was a, a really excellent win in, the in our, I think it was a third division promotion year. Um, in the year that we won promotion from the third division, that was a fantastic season. I remember that very much. Um, I went to a lot of away matches. So I remember catching the train and having to leave Swindon Town early. We lost 2-0. The following Saturday, I hitchhiked up to Chesterfield. And we, again, we lost 2-0. And um, I got a lift. I was hitchhiking back, and with my girlfriend, another friend of mine, we were picked up by um, the chairman, Michael Glickstein, Although he didn't admit it at the time, it was a very strange conversation in the car. He said he was something to do with the club. He was obviously a Charlton fan. I mean, he remembered matches. He remembered Alan Campbell's goal against Northampton. He was very much a, a fan. And um, you know, he he said that Bob Stoko didn't have it at the crunch, which. Uh, it was interesting considering Sunderland winning the cup a few years later under Bob Stogo's management. Um, he didn't comment when I said how bad it was that Fermani had been sacked, because I think that by that time we'd gone through through Theo Foley and were on to Andy Nelson. And Arthur Horsfield might have been playing centre half in those days as well. Um, the following Tuesday we were at home to Preston for the promotion match. What a game! I think uh, they went one nil up. We missed a penalty, and I thought, oh no, we're not going to make it. And we ended up winning 3-1, and the atmosphere that night was just fantastic. It was, it, uh, it's a word I use a lot, but I mean, the thrill of being a football fan is is those great moments when when you win promotion, like that night against Preston, where you know I admit to being of more mature years in those days, but still invading the pitch and and um, wanting to to celebrate with with the players who I think came out onto, into the stand and garbled words uh, I remember the microphone was passed to um, it might have been what was the name that sent off? Johnny Giles, Jimmy Giles Jimmy Giles, Farmer Giles the sent off what a lovely player he was and he just yelled into the microphone in some kind of inc incomprehensible way, <laughs> I couldn't understand a word of it but you could certainly understand the feeling well, no, that, was, that was lovely um, I also of course winning promotion from the second division to the first, albeit at Selhurst Park. The feeling of, of getting into the first division, I'd never seen them in anything but the second and for four seasons in the third. And uh, to get into the first division was just a fantastic feeling. The game against Fulham, where we Paul Parker played us on his own, 
stood out in my mind as the game where we actually won promotion. Unfortunately, I didn't go to Carlisle. I regret I regret that now. But um, that was that was a, a brilliant feeling winning promotion then. Funnily enough, when we were relegated for the one season um, that was that Mike Bailey took over and then won promotion straight away, I didn't feel so despondent because I thought we were unfortunate to get relegated that season. And um, I had a feeling we might bounce back. Um, it was a pity, actually, that Mike Bailey didn't stay with the club, but um, he went on to Brighton, I think, and then we had Alan Mullery, who was, I think, a bit of a disaster area for the club all round. And, um, well, that was that. The atmosphere at the Valley. Oh, um, on a good day, particularly evening matches, when if the crowd was low, you couldn't you couldn't see it. Um, it was just great. It was just I, I I can't describe the feeling of of um, the football at the Valley. It's a, a, a ground full of character. Um, the old stand with the zigzag roof I used to love. I didn't mind it so much when they put on the flat roof. And um, there was the covered end. There was the away end that was gradually developed. Um, and when there was a big crowd for a cup game, um, it was just a marvellous arena for football. I remember perhaps the best player I've ever, ever actually seen um, was Rodney Marsh. Um, when we played Queen's Park Rangers in the cup, we went 2-0 up in about 20 minutes, 25,000 odd crowd there. And uh, Rodney Marsh scored two goals to make it 2-2 by half-time. Both superb volleys on the turn from the edge of the area in at about knee height. Lovely goals. And then the second half, right down in front of me where I was standing, I remember him, the ball was stationary and he just wriggled his bum while the Charlton player stood off, off and then he just pushed it and went straight past him and he was doing that the whole time. And the winning goal came from Marsh being quite clearly he'd broken through and he was um, faced with the goalkeeper and I think it might have been Eustace was coming alongside him and you know, in, in brilliantly unselfish fashion he just put it sideways to Eustace who was, who was in a slightly better position to score who scored the winning goal I was very very impressed with Rodney Marsh I thought he was a, an incredibly skillful player I only saw George Best when he played for Fulham and those that, those days he was past his best but um, a great player a, more, a great player of recent years that I've seen play is John Barnes of Liverpool um, he's always played well against us and I think he's a, a beautifully skillful player and um, the game this season when we lost 4-0 at home to Liverpool Bar Ronnie Rosenthal scored three goals but the star was undoubtedly John Barnes he, uh, a supreme talent really um, there was lots of lovely songs um, I actually wrote an article for Voice of the Valley which you might want to look up about songs in those days um, I remember I eventually graduated to standing in the little bank of terracing to the between the, the main stand and the covered end. Well, uh, that was my place for many, many years until the last game at the Valley. And behind us, um, I say us because I didn't know the names of very many people. I had sort of personal nicknames for people. Um, I used to nod to about 20 people when taking up my place, which was always the same place. The familiar faces around me. I always got talking to a guy I called the Major because he had a kind of military bearing. He was a very nice guy. And uh, you'd part freely pass comments with people you regard as your friends, really, around and about. But about five steps up the terrace behind us was this big, thick, heavy step set guy that my friend Les and I used to call Pickled Onion for some reason. I think he once said, yelled out, Peter Hunt, your heart's as big as a pickled onion. Get on with it. And the, he was just fantastically funny. I wish I could recall the comments. He had a particular um, skill at winding up linesmen. Um, if it was a bald-headed linesman, you know, get out of the way, linesman, your head's shining in my eyes, and can't you keep up with the play, linesman, you're not fit, and, you know, oh, the referee had to overrule you there, I'll tell you what was happening there, linesman, oh, he, he was merciless um, dealing with the linesman, but he would come out with regular comical comments um, every game. The wit on the on the Charlton Terrace, I can't remember examples, unfortunately, but the only other place I've been to that gets anywhere near is Orion. Um... I think that the comments from the crowd, you know, long-suffering Charlton supporters, um, were always superb. And and if the game was going badly, you could always get a laugh from from the odd comment. <laughs> Pre-match and half-time entertainment. Oh well, sometimes it was. I remember a very bedraggled circus wandering around the pitch once at half-time. I think there was an animal. I can't remember what one. It might have been a camel, and some people dressed up. Yeah, it must have been all of about four of them 
sometimes there'd be bands marching up and down um, I don't remember only the odd youngster doing ball skills but there wasn't much in the way of pretty much entertainment I went to both the Who concerts at the Valley and the crowds were there were the biggest I've ever been in at the Valley um, that was quite good I remember actually seeing quite a few people in the crowd with Charlton um, scarves on even though it was a baking hot day the first one it poured with rain the second one um, it was quite amazing to think that I saw Little Feet at the Valley and Lou Reed and the Who that they, they played at the Valley um, Little Feet particularly who are a, a fantastic band to think they played at the Valley Lowell, George and all bless him he's dead now um, is quite a, a warm feeling I've been to our place our home um, I, I went to club open days at the Valley as well where you'd wander around aimlessly and look at embarrassed players standing there not knowing whether you could start a conversation and, and seeing little kids ask for their autograph which seems to be the tradition now I mean I'd like to talk to players really but I've never really had the courage to talk to many I have had conversations with some I once met Paul Elliott at my school's I'm a school teacher um, sports day when he was going out with uh, one of the older girls in the school he'd gone to Luton by then and had a lovely conversation with him a nice guy and incidentally a very good player when he was with Charlton one of the fastest centre halves we ever had um, when when the club was liquidised in 1984 well I just cried I came home and heard the news um, on something like a Tuesday that the club were, were dead and I just sat and cried I couldn't believe it and I bit my nails all the way through to the end of that week and I think it was announced that, that people had come in and rescued them um, it was just unbelievable um, the message to our supporters well I, I was completely flawed and stunned I think we'd had a good start to that second division campaign well obviously we did we, we won promotion at the end hello and um, sorry about saying hello I was just seeing if I was still recording I think the tape's coming near to the end of this half uh, I was handed this piece of paper we're going to Crystal Palace somebody said and I read it and I still couldn't believe it I think I think we were playing Palace that day um, it was a good day a lovely you know we won I think or it might have been a draw and I couldn't believe it again I went home and just sat and cried that we were leaving leaving the um, valley um, I the last game against Stoke City will stand out in my mind for a long time I, I stood amongst all the people that I'd been standing amongst for by that time it was many years I think I started standing in that spot in about 1970 two and was there ever since except for the odd rainy day when I go into the free seats under the cabin end and all these guys you know old, old guys and that that stood there none of them hooligans in any way we just stood and, and cried our eyes out for about 20 minutes after the game all of us staring at the grass it was unbelievable I saw people there with obviously old scarves with names t um, sewn into them Huey and Leary and Bartram and um, a guy dressed up in an undertaker's outfit I, I remember wanting the pitch to be invaded by the supporters and wanting them to show how they felt but obviously not to stop the game and certainly not to, to smash the crossbar which looked like happening at one point but luckily our supporters stopped it happening and it was the most heartbreaking and devastating experience I think I've ever felt with Charlton more than losing games or being relegated um, leaving the valley a place where I'd like my ashes to be scattered was just the worst moment of being a Charlton supporter I've ever known without any competition at all I I couldn't believe that there wasn't a way around it I couldn't believe that um, we couldn't have got the way supporters into just the, the away end and made arrangements um, obviously there's wheelings and dealings that have gone on that have never been clearly explained but I, I of all the places we could have gone to, Millwall would have been okay, West Ham would have been okay, but Crystal Palace, of all the places, was the worst of the lot. But I knew even then, I was never one who felt, I'm not going to go to Selhurst Park, Park, I knew even then that I would go, because I loved the team, I loved the football, and it had meant so much to me. But that feeling of, of leaving the Valley, and that last game against Stoke, was one that I'll never forget, and one that I, I still, you know, Recording it now gives me painful memories, and I, you know, I'll go on to talk about um, being involved in the, the Valley campaign. I just wish that one day we can go back, and and uh, you know, that will make all the difference to me. You know, I don't care what division we're in; 
if we're back at the valley that's all that matters and I'm sure that's what many other supporters would say I'm just going to see how much tape there is left I'm turning over doing very well on dates um, and you know specifics I, I think that I, my memories aren't that particular um, it's uh, you know it's more of a, a, a holistic approach I suppose um, I would never ever describe Selhurst Park as a home ground for Charles it's never felt that way I've never felt happy there I, I've enjoyed games I've enjoyed seeing us win and good performances and certainly Lenny Lawrence's team has been the best team I've ever seen at Charlton. That guy is, is just fantastic. Um, but no, it's not our home ground. Travelling to Selhurst, well, I'm a motorcyclist. I remember on a little 100cc bike in my early days of being on two wheels, going up to Ipswich for the cup game away and it, oh, in a February and it was cold and it seemed to take hours, but I made it all the same. At the Valley I could park, I used to park just inside the main gate a very kind grounds and would let a couple of motorcyclists park there. Um, so going to sell us by motorbike was my experience initially. Terrible. I tried every route there was going. I would pour over the A to Z, um, look for back doubles here, cut throughs there. But it was always murder, even on a motorbike. Believe you me, parking obviously is easy on a motorbike, but um, the, the travelling was terrible. I could get home from the valley um, when I lived in Lewisham and now in Lee. Um, in by t in time for 5 o'clock Radio 2 Sports Report which I, of course I would enjoy very much can't do that coming home from, on a motorbike from Sellers Park and I haven't got a radio on the bike so I miss out on that I miss out on it not being my local ground and near to my home um, so Sellers Park is you know I, I, I've recently been getting lifts with a friend and we go there together again parking is murder we always seem to end up Arriving two minutes after the kickoff, on the dot, two minutes after the kickoff, um, and I, I, you know, I don't enjoy it. I'm looking forward to the day we get back to the valley, no other place to the valley. Away grounds that I've been to, um, I've been, I've had lots of good experiences. I remember, especially in my early days when I'd hitchhike alone, usually to away games. Um, once uh, I, was, I hitchhiked on Boxing Day to Norwich when we had a 3-0 defeat, lots of away 3-0 defeats in my time. And I was, I was on a roundabout just outside Norwich on the way in. I was picked up by the supporters coach. I had my Charlton scarf to help hitchhiking. And as I got on the coach, um, they yelled, oh, he's an Arsenal supporter, chuck him off. But they were very good natured. And I think I got home for, for 10 bob or 50p. I don't remember if the money had changed then. So I was quite relieved it had been a hard hitchhike on Boxing Day. Um, hitchhiked all over the place really um, Oxford um, Chesterfield Wolves um, all over um, I remember once I hitchhiked up to Manchester this is ridiculous when they were in the second division the one season they were relegated and we drew them in the League Cup and eventually lost 5-1 in an evening match and I hitchhiked all the way up for that um, we went a goal up after two minutes um, and then they beat us 5-1 <laughs> uh, I remember the, the Manchester United supporters we kicked off and it was boo, 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 silence. P 
because I think actually it wasn't two minutes we, we scored straight from the kickoff, and <laughs> but they went on to to thrash us. Um, Macari I think scored a couple of goals that day. Um, Peter Hunt I think was the Charlton scorer. A nice little player, Peter Hunt always gave hundred um, percent. A very uh, one of the many many players Charlton have had in the Steve Grit mould. Steve Grit is probably the supreme example of the hundred percent hard working. You know never let their head drop always fight for the team type of players which I think every every team needs and uh, Peter Hunt was one of those Steve Grit well Grit is now a legend he's not a player um, the times that Steve Grit has, has come on he obviously it, you know is Charlton through and through like the supporters very very holding a lot of affection by the supporters and always gave 100% he might lack some odd skills but he doesn't doesn't he just shrugs it off and carries on I think actually Steve Grit might make a very good manager for some reason he, he seems to be very bright um, very sensitive very caring I've seen him turn up at reserve matches without other players being there and I think Steve Grit is the kind, the kind of guy who could be a very good manager I don't know if he, if he ever thinks about that but um, he strikes me as being that kind of guy Um, I've enjoyed going to away matches. Um, had you know, I, don't, I haven't enjoyed some grounds, um, Plymouth and Fulham, for example, where I've had guys hectoring me from my shoulder, telling me how bad my team were, how good their team were. When I'd initially, they'd initially started conversations in a quite a friendly manner, and then kind of insinuated their hectoring, dominant manner on me um, once they'd got my attention. But other places that I've been to, I've found very, very fair-minded guys and women, women to sit, stand next to and talk to and admire the good and the bad points of both teams. That's particularly happened at Wolves, at Norwich, at Orient, um, Manchester United even in that game. Um, and ver even Crystal Palace, dare I say. Um, but And those are the good memories. Um, I felt I, I, there had been trouble at odd matches, um, nothing like the kind of trouble that we used to see now on the television. Um, but I've never really had any any personal involvement in any trouble. Nothing's ever impinged on me, and I've certainly never been part of any trouble. It doesn't seem to be really the Charlton way. Um, whenever there's any trouble, I think the Charlton supporters just melt away and, and just you know keep their own counsel and. Uh, as they have to do most of the time anyway and deal with it in their own way very good supporters Charlton very loyal very loyal um, as loyal as any supporters in the ground in the country even if there aren't very many of us um, very, I must admit to having fiddled my the odd train fare to away matches going over the bridge from the underground to the British Rail at Barking and getting a train out to South End and paying from the previous station did that as a student when I was a student I was incredibly poor how I, I mean, the first thing that would come out of my grant check would be the season ticket, and then I would survive on the rest and um, a ground season ticket, which was a very good value. And I would, you know, travel basically by scrimping, really. The best grounds I've been to, Old Trafford, without a doubt, um, apart from the Valley, which is easily the best ground in the in the world. Um, Aston Villa, nice ground, I like that very much. Shrewsbury, which I think is a, a favourite of a lot of people. Um, I enjoy most grounds, really. Some of them are a bit dull. Reading, for example. But um, it's always interesting to see another football ground. Um, and there's always that little buzz when you see the floodlights and you, you gather in with the people that are close to the ground walking to the match and the programme sellers and the peanuts and the sort of very clean police horses occasionally. And... Uh, Often quite a nice atmosphere and anticipation. I've always enjoyed that. Um, I once got a lift home, hitchhiking home from Colchester by a Sunday People reporter, John Smith. Oh, I think he's the man of the people now, but that, those days reported on football. Well, um, it was interesting talking to him. He dropped me off, my, unfortunately, in Chelmsford, and it took me hours after that to get home. Um, and many, many Charlton supporters have picked me up, um, seeing the red scarf, you know, you dangle as you, underneath your thumb, and they take you home, and uh, I, I wish I could thank them in some way. Um, lovely people, great conversations, um, as passionate as me, you know, 
guys who say, oh, well, if we lose, I'll just get me regular Sunday paper, but if we win, I'll go out and buy them all <laughs> to read the match reports. I know the feeling. I think we've all been there sometime. I mean, the money I've spent on scraps of information about Charlton, seeing their name in a magazine or in a newspaper or hoping to, to see a team list or something is, is phenomenal. Um, I think these days we're better served, although I do miss the old evening news classified. I used to love that. When I lived in Tottenham as a student, um, you could get the train from Charlton to Charing Cross and the classifiers would be out and you could read it on the tube up to Seven Sisters and uh, it was great. I love the classifiers. Um, I think occasionally I'd be a member of a supporters club, um, but I never really became involved, especially with travelling. I, 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 I think once or twice I've travelled on a supporters club coach, but that's all. Um, best players Charlton ever had? Well, by, by repute, um, Stuart Leary, Eddie Fermani, um, Sam Bartram, Charlie Revel, Charlie Vaughan. These are players that my dads and uh, various older generation of my family have mentioned. Um, my dad was a great fan of Stanley Matthews he thought, and Tom Finney, he thought were great players. Um, the ones that of the ones that I have seen, the best ever. Well, Paul Walsh has to go down as one of the best ever. So must Anna Simonson. These players were outstandingly good. You know, and you had to be blind not to realise how good they were. Um, we've had a lot of good players. I mean, the best ever Charlton team would be phenomenal. Um, oh, Hale, as I've mentioned, Peacock is another brilliant player. These days, well, a lot of them. Johnny Humphrey. Um, great player, John Humphrey. Best fullback we've had since Terry Naylor, and he was a good player. Um, it, it's very difficult to say the best players we've ever had because, in their own way, all of them have had something to offer the club. I mean, one or two duffers, but. Colin Powell would be a reason for going there alone. He may not be brilliant every week, but he was a fantastic player when he was on song. Derek Hales, I've said him enough times, was. You know, obviously a particular favourite of mine, Killer. Um, I remember Lenny Glover. I remember him playing for Leicester brilliantly against us. Um, he was a very good player. Mike Kenning. Um, Graham Moore, I thought was a very skilled player. Mickey Flanagan. Oh, there's so many good players we've had. It's it's hard to to list them all. I've probably forgotten more than I can remember. Um, lots of the players who left and went moved on to better things. I remember as very good players. Worst players Charlton have ever had. Oh. Um, I think Tony Hazel in his spell with Charlton was one of the worst I've ever seen. I mean, he was just unbelievable. Eamon Rogers, another one. Um, oh, we've had some bad ones. Uh, no, I think the most outstandingly inept player I've ever seen play for Charlton was Tony Hazel. He was obviously a good player earlier on with, Queen, with Queen's Park Rangers, but he was just so outstanding I mean he looked he was, he was somebody who didn't melt away from view he caught the eye had very black hair and a bit of a rotund appearance to say the least and he was um, awful other good players we've had um, Harry Cripps was brilliant for us so was Eamon Dunphy you know I know they came from Millwall but they were very good servants for Charlton in you know during my years of watching them um I don't really want to talk about the worst players we've had. I know we've had some, but pff, so what? So is everybody. Um, now, I, ha I attended the public meeting at Charlton about the Valley, about Valley Return. There was about 50-50 people speaking, you know, with concerns and in favour. I went to the meeting where the, the announcement of the Valley, that's one of my best ever experiences as a Charlton supporter, was going to the meeting where Roger Orwin announced the return to the Valley. I mean, I, I, it was just... I knew it was going to come, obviously we all did, but the feeling I got in my my diaphragm was just something else. But that was that was beaten by um, the clean-up day. Um, we played Middlesbrough the day before. And the Sunday morning broke pretty wet and miserable, and I wondered whether anyone would turn up. But I put the spade on the back of my motorbike and went down there, and I heard this scrape, scrape, scrape from all around. And that was about a quarter to ten. We were meant to be there at ten. And I walked in, and saw all these people there clearing up the valley with you know in the rain in the drizzle getting mucky doing it doing it doing it and oh i mean the thrill 
I got seeing so many when I thought there'd be about 10 of us there. I met one guy who'd stayed up overnight from Taunton. He'd been up for the Middlesbrough game. He was there with his little boy. Um, there were obviously people like that all over the place. Another guy had the Red Red Robin proper version on a, on a cassette player, which he put down in the middle of the East Terrace and played over and over again. People were coming around giving tea. Um, it was just, it was lovely. I mean, it had nothing to do with the football. What it did had everything to do with the football, but the feeling of camaraderie and togetherness was just thrilling. You know, you could talk to anybody. It was, it was just marvellous. Um, I scraped the terraces with the spade and, and put muck and weeds and that on the pile. And um, I, I enjoyed every minute of it. You know, I, I, I left when it looked like there was nothing else to do. You know, within about an hour, we we turned the place into a place that you could imagine football happening in again. Managers. Bob Stoko, reasonable manager. Eddie Fermani, very good manager. Got the team playing great football. Um, who took you off? Theo Foley, good spotter of players. I mean, after all, he brought in Derek Hales. He brought in um, Mike Flanagan, I think. <laughs> um, very good eye for a player. He, he had the wit to sign Eamon Dunphy. Harry Cripps. Uh, he, I think he was a pretty good manager for spotting players, Theo Foley. Probably underrated. Um, Andy Nelson, in his early days, great. Obviously had authority, um, and he had a good foundation to build on from Foley, and he made the most of it. And He just went a bit autocratic at the end, and I think he, he lost it that way. Um, Alan Murray didn't have much time for him. Mike Bailey, we didn't play very exciting football. He was very effective, probably like he was, he was as a player unexciting but effective with his big barrel chest Alan Mullery duh, a poser didn't think he was any good you know when he said that Don McAllister was one of the best players we could ever have and he'd be worth millions and he could control the ball with a piece of string um, didn't buy any of that he sold you know he had one or two good little touches he, he knew how to put Paul Elliott up front when we were losing which we, which we inevitably were hoping to snatch an equalising goal. Ken Craggs, well, by that time he was under the, you know, there was a kind of Svengali, Marmon influence, and uh, I don't think Craig Craggs had a chance. And then, of course, along came Lenny. Well, if ever, you know, there was a kind of baby in the bull rushes waiting to, to lead us to the promised land, is Lenny Lawrence. He, he was, the, he's the greatest thing that's ever happened to Charlton in my time of watching the club when you consider the experiences I've been through with the, the close down of the club, the moving of the ground taking us to the first division, building a team, finding players turning ordinary players into excellent players, I mean Lenny Lawrence is, is a brilliant, brilliant guy a brilliant manager, he is peerless in my estimation um, I don't think there's a better manager in football today you know, obviously I'm biased but how, how many other people would have the courage that's what I call it, the courage, the nerve, the standards of, of Lenny Lawrence. He, all right, he's made mistakes, but everyone's made mistakes, but you know his achievements, if you had a, a scales of, of justice and you put his mistakes and his you know, miscalculations on one side and his achievements on the other, you know the floor would crack as the scales went zooming through the floorboards. It, it's just so much in his favour. Um, I'd give him a 10-year contract if it was... If I was the chairman, I know lots of supporters mutter about Lenny. They always think the grass is going to be greener, but no, Lenny Lawrence. If we, I, I think if we lose him, especially now that we're relegated, then it, it could be the end for the club, which is the thing that we all dread. It's our dark nightmare that we all dread, isn't it? Um, present board of directors, great. I like Robert Roger Orwin. He's a fan. Plans for the Valley, brilliant plans for the Valley. Um, I was at the Hales Flanagan fight. Um, I didn't see it breaking out. I remember being astonished when they were uh, <laughs> sent off. Um, I'm glad we won the replay against Maystone. They had a good support there. Um, now, the Valley party, well, this has been the thrill recently. I mean, we've been relegated this season, but I obviously am, I live in Lee and I'm unable to vote. But. Um, in recent weeks, I've been. I went out on the Saturday when we didn't have a game and gave out leaflets outside a betting office in East Greenwich. Lots of people were really quite positive. A guy comes and says, "Oh, I don't know whether I should vote for you. Like I'm an Evertonian." 
And uh, by the time I finished talking to you, I said, yeah, all right, I'll vote for you. Then um, shortly after that, or in, in the week of the election, I went canvassing in Sherard Ward, and um, it was a great feeling canvassing people. I mean, I called at 37 households and had about 35 people of the probably 80 voters that lived in those houses saying they would vote Valley. And there was a very positive response um, and fantastically impressive campaign, um, which got marvellous publicity, particularly from The Guardian. And then um, I leafleted on the Wednesday before the game all over West Greenwich, right out in the Deptford fringe of Greenwich. And um, again, there was a positive response. Um, old boy, you know, very miserable old boy. Of course I'm going to vote for you. I was born there before there was even a football ground there. I remember before it was a ground. You know, but in his gruff way, he was still going to vote for us. And then I, I um, helped on the Thursday, the day of the election. And I went out um, round on my motorbike collecting up numbers from the polling stations in Sherrard and taking them back so that we could then get out the vote later in the evening. We went and got out the vote um, and then everyone, I didn't have a ticket for the count, all the other people went off to the count and I think it's one of the most brilliant achievements by any group of supporters you could ever have. A party that was formed six weeks prior to the election gaining 11% of the vote third highest number of votes cast after Labour and Tory in the in the borough. Um, it's just unbelievable. I uh, Quentin Marsh's um, majority of 13, 1,300 being knocked down to 369 by Kevin Fox and him being overtaken in his walk by the Charlton supporting Labour guy. Oleman losing his seat, which I'm delighted about. Good. You know, the guy was at the planning meeting that I went to, chair or not chairing the meeting, but you know, being there overseeing fair play. Well if judging by the response of the meeting, um, there wasn't much objection to Charlton going back to the valley that couldn't have been got round with things like residence parking. And I'm delighted, really delighted he's out. Good. Goodbye. Um I think the Valley Party, um time would only tell whether it makes any difference, but you know, if anything in a funny kind of way sums up Charlton and being a Charlton supporter. It's this reliance on, on the self, this finding a well inside yourself that is resilient. Because, my God, we've had to be resilient over the years, the, the disappointments and defeats we've had. Um, recent years, we've had it quite well. But, you know, that's been tinged with losing the valley. And to go back again, all right, we're a dwindling band, but to go back again after we've lost 5 1 at home to Rotherham and still take it again on the chin builds up a kind of resilience that I don't think you get in, in live, dare I say it with the greatest respect, Liverpool supporters who haven't known that kind of hardship and to go out and fight the way we have in the in the elections for the Valley Party is I mean, no, I can't believe anybody else would have the imagination the wit, the resilience the resources, the intelligence to do it and to gain 14,800 votes, just go I mean, that probably actually, to be truthful, represents about 8,000 people but just represents what football still means. I'm, so, I'm recording this the day after Leeds have, have um, rioted at Bournemouth, and that, unfortunately, is, is not going to help us. But it still shows what football means to a lot of good, ordinary, decent people who love something in life with a bit of glory, something that isn't just the mundane grind of getting through, something that matters. I mean, football has seen me personally through heartbreaks, broken relationships, being a student, getting jobs, changing jobs, moving house, um, ups, downs, good health, bad health, but it's been there and it's been my rock, really. And um, I'm, I, you know, a lot of people would sneer at uh, the idea of football providing that much for you and it, may, it makes it sound like a religion, but I suppose it has been, in a way, a kind of something greater than one individual that you can you can relate to I mean going to football is one of the few communal activities people have got left after going to church which is dwindling and um, being with your fellow person in a shared experience oh, that is yeah it's got a religious tinge to it so football is a religion I suppose and certainly has been to me if I was to, to look at it in those terms but I still remember you know, the players when I was a kid first going there who didn't close their eyes when they were going to head the ball 
and being amazed at their physical skill at doing that. And still now, I watched John Barnes the other day, I watch Scott Minto and Robert Lee, remember Paul Walsh, and I look at these people and what they can do in a sporting sense, you know, the football and the skill that it shows, the enterprise, the, the athleticism, and that still compels me, as well as, of course, caring about the result of my team. And, um, you know, I, I'm proud to be a Charlton supporter. I'm, I'm glad. I mean, it, other clubs that you can be proud of, well, none of them had the attraction of Charlton. Um, I don't think you can be proud of being a supporter of many other London clubs, apart from possibly West Ham. Um, uh, other clubs in the country. Well, I admire people who support Torquay, Aldershot, Scarborough now, um, Hartlepool. These are the people that I think are, are the real, true lifeblood of the game. You know, ones who, who care and um, care enough to, to put up with the knocks for the moments. You know, so that the sweet, the fruit, you know, the sweet bits, can must be just that much sweeter for the likes of us Charlton supporters and other others of our ilk than it must be for Liverpool supporters. Another championship, another cup win. Huh. Was it as sweet as the last one? But those moments of glory for us lot, nothing can ever taste as sweet as that. You know, you've just got to remember that playoff game at St Andrews against Leeds. <laughs> you know, those are the kind of moments that you live for as a Charlton supporter. And thankfully they come around with enough regularity to keep you going. Anyway, I think that's about all I can say on the subject. I hope that this might give you something that you can use. I don't think it will give you very much. And um, I hope it hasn't been too onerous listening to it. All right. Bye-bye.